you know, there was a, a humongous raid here in the Four Corners back in, I want to say 2009. It was terrible, but it involved several people, upstanding professional members of the community, both in Utah and here in Colorado. But it was an enormous raid uh, by the federal authorities, and these people had lots and lots of stuff. And again, they they were the type that may, perhaps they had sold at some of it, but they they were appreciating it. They had it in their basement or on their mantel places or in their offices. And they were basically, you know, arrested. At least two of the few that were arrested uh, decided to end their own lives over this. And so it's a very, very sensitive subject here still. In 2009, the Bureau of Land Management conducted a raid called Operation Cerberus Action. They invaded the homes of a number of antiquities dealers and collectors in Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. They seized stolen artifacts and indicted a number of people with federal charges. Two of those people committed suicide. Later, the informant that the FBI used to gather evidence against those people also committed suicide. The raid is a big part of the reason why people are so opposed to any kind of expanded federal presence in the area. I talked to Joe Mazingo, a reporter for the LA Times who wrote a long article about the raid. Joe's article makes it clear that the way the government gathered evidence against the defendants in this case wasn't entirely above board. Yeah, my name is Joe Mazingo. I am a reporter with the LA Times. Well, they focused on Jeannie Red. I mean, the Reds were somewhat famous as pot hunters down there because they had already had a big case against them. A lot of people, Native Americans and archaeologists, thought they kind of just got a slap on the wrist. Even though it was never, Dr. Red was never really into it. He just kind of enabled his wife. They learned of this person that could become an informant in this, this world that they tried to go after before and kind of failed a couple times. So this informant started talking to everyone he could about who was who trafficked and traded everything from just small arrowheads to elaborate baskets and pots and he was able to kind of get into the reds world they were kind of the biggest fish the fbi agents could identify now it's not really clear because i couldn't get the tapes that were done in arizona and some of the other states because there were some big time dealers down there that he was also talking to but for whatever reason the u.s attorneys in those states didn't go didn't prosecute those cases and you know i reached out to them and no one would comment as to why do you have a sense of how much of a world it really was? They call it a looting ring, or like how much of a of a marketplace there there was for this? I think a ring is definitely a misnomer. I mean, all these people operated on their own. Part of it was a hobby. I mean, you know, there's not much to do in this area. So a lot of older men would just go hiking, and it was a way to stay in shape, and it was a way to make hiking a little bit more interesting. And, and as far as a ring, the informant was the one that made it a ring because he was the one that tying all these people together. Were the artifacts worth as much as the FBI claimed they were in, in the court cases? Definitely what they got Dr. Red on was overvalued. And I, my sense generally is, yes, they overvalued things to try to get felonies. I mean, you could tell, just from the tapes, you could tell a lot of the younger guys were coming out like, oh my God, there's this guy in town flush with money. He's saying he'll pay more than everyone else. And sometimes people actually looked at the informant like he was nuts when he was offering to pay a certain amount for something. So yeah, I think they were overvaluing. And then I, I had appraisers. You know, and these appraisers are part of the legal market, so to speak, at least. They have certain sympathies, obviously, but they, they were really strongly emphatic that these things were completely out of whack as far as pricing. That's another thing I'm kind of confused about is the legal market in antiquities trading. Where, when does something enter the legal market? Is it only when it's picked up or found on private property? Yeah, I mean it's 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 that's what makes this well what makes it so fascinating and kind of such a moral conundrum too is that you know it's you're digging up basically graves. So yeah, I mean so if it's a moral issue like you shouldn't be digging up graves, it seems odd that you can just dig up graves on private land. I mean in Colorado, Southwest Colorado, there's much more private land than there is right across the state line in Utah. And you could do whatever whatever you want. I mean, you're supposedly not supposed to dig up graves, but it's so impossible to prove that it came from a grave. You can do whatever you want effectively on private land. So on the moral issue, that's always been weird. That's why the whole thing is really difficult to investigate. And I do understand that's why they tried to go at it this way, because this way they were trying to get people on tape 
admitting that they got it from public land. But a lot of times, you know, it's it's like having a fisherman tell you where he caught a fish. You know, they don't. A lot of times, they don't want to say where they went, so they'll make up another spot. But I mean, you talk. I think your average person's instinct, if you were to be walking through this desert and there's just a pot sitting in the middle of nowhere and it's beautiful pot, 600 years old, you know, it could get washed away in the rains, a cow could step on it. You know, I think most people would say, oh, wow, you know, let's grab that. <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, I think that's, it's, it's, it's human nature to want to take this stuff. It's just, you, you got to think about the, the repercussions. Is the finding of this FBI investigation any good indication of, of the scale of the looting problem? I don't think so. I mean, I think the people are still definitely looting. I mean, they're probably not talk you know they're a little bit more careful who they talk to i think the and i don't know how this would really change the looting unless they had a lot of a lot more enforcement i can only imagine the anti-government blanding type people not wanting a few more rangers out there if that's the big if that's the big problem um because right now i mean it's like one i forget what it is the blm is like one ranger for a million acres so there's no chance in the world a ranger is going to catch you in the act of digging up something so maybe it would be a slightly more of a chance it was a national monument. It's still pretty vast out there. But I think just generally in Blanding, the feeling I got was people just didn't like any government because just they got there in the turn of the century and they they lived an incredibly harsh life to try to make that place work. I mean, it was the last part of Utah that was settled. The journey just to get there was murderous. You know, they had to move from Bluff to Blanding just to get better water and, and then... You know, they, they finally, they started making money off these uranium mines and ranching. And um, then suddenly the federal government, in their view, comes in and starts trying to curtail all these things. And they, they kind of see the federal government as interlopers because they weren't really there in any real visible way earlier. And then, and also, and I, they shut off a lot of roads, ban ATVing. And then now kind of the pot hunting is one more. It's hard to explain. I mean, to people who don't, haven't been through there, just how little there is to do except go out and explore. It's just such a small town and so far from anywhere else. Phil Lyman, San Juan County Commissioner, Utah. I'll try to be brief on this, but in 2009, the BLM came in and raided uh, Blanding, Utah, with 140 federal agents and armored cars and weapons and dogs and you name it, and it was overkill. It was a military-type exercise. It wasn't appreciated. It wasn't warranted. And uh, and that kind of launched this feeling of, hey, we have people at the BLM who dislike us, who would hurt us if they had the opportunity to do so. The the FBI raids you're talking about, that was um, Operation Cerberus Action. Yeah, and, and with, with uh, Dr. Red's, uh, Jim Red's um, death, it was it put a real exclamation point on that whole thing and so yeah uh, and especially for those of us who knew and loved dr red and know his family and and especially those who understood the uh falseness of the accusations and the and the whole charges they were motivated motivated by these environmental groups is it fair to say that there was like a background frustration with the federal government that was like extremely exacerbated by the by the raids in 2009 well i think the frustration is really with the environmental groups, and it just turns out that the BLM is their weapon of choice, and they're very willing. BLM is, I, I don't know that BLM is malicious of their own accord. They're just such a willing tool in the hands of, of, of groups that want to manipulate them. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly that it's like party politics as much as it just is, you know, groups with money, with an agenda. So this Bureau of Land Management, or BLM, raid happens in 2009, and that wound still hasn't closed. I talked to a representative from the BLM and asked him about the raids. Do you feel that the, the scale of the arms and personnel employed in those raids was appropriate? Oh, I mean, that's, uh, I, I think that matter is already before the, the courts. I don't think we can comment on that. This kind of avoidance I think is pretty typical of the ways in which federal bodies will interact with locals or people asking questions about these cases. And I think that this greatly contributes to the frustration felt by the people in these communities. 